First, I'd like to thank the organizers of this year's conference for inviting me to be here. I was here a couple of years ago to talk about my Marx and Engels book, and I welcome the opportunity to share with you my new book on Marx and Engels and Tocqueville and the topic of race in the United States. I'm especially pleased that you were able to be here given the events of yesterday, and I see this as an opportunity for me also to interact with you all and to get some feedback in the progressive revolutionary circles in which I operate in the United States. People there are – people there will be very interested in knowing what progressive-minded revolutionary forces here in the U.K. are thinking about developments that happened yesterday, so I welcome the opportunity to be here. Along those lines, I might mention that Marx and Engels also had to grapple with issues similar to yesterday's events that happened in the 1867. There were bombings that took place in London. The Finians, Irish nationalists, and Marx and Engels had to figure out how you respond. What should revolutionaries say next? They also had to grapple with this question around the Russian – with Russian revolutionaries, also people like Vera Zosulich and others who were also involved in what was described by Russian authorities as terrorist activities. I mention that at the outset because, as some of you may be aware of, in my previous book on Marx and Engels, I stressed – tried to make a case for Marx and Engels as political activists. As I've said, sometimes I've been on a campaign to rescue Marx and Engels from the clutches of theorists to bring them back into politics. And issues such as terrorism, bombings, and so on are the kinds of things that were very much a part of the discussions they had in the world in which they operated politically. There's one myth about Marx and Engels amongst the many misconceptions, misrepresentations that I'm also interested in trying to dispel. It has to do with the topic of race. It's been a longstanding claim that they didn't talk about race. And this longstanding claim was revived by postmodernists, postcolonialists in one form or another. I hope in this new book to dispel that claim that they supposedly ignored the topic of race. This project grew out of the previous project. I spent some time looking at Marx and Engels' activities in the 1848 revolutions, how they organized themselves and the kinds of things that they were doing. And along the way, I discovered that there was another activist in the 1848 revolutions. That was Alexis de Tocqueville. De Tocqueville is oftentimes known – I don't know what his status here in Britain, but certainly in the United States, his book, Democracy in America, is revered by many commentators, intellectuals, academics, and so on. It's almost sacrosanct, his book. And what's oftentimes not known is that Tocqueville was an activist. He was not simply a social theorist, but he also sought to make history. And this is what I discovered in the 1848 revolutions. Tocqueville, however, was a counter-revolutionary. He was a counter-revolutionary to the core. He was a member of parliament. He mobilized members in the National Assembly to go out and crush – to crush the working class mobilizations. There's a lot of blood on his hands, the blood of workers in Paris as a result of Tocqueville's activities. And if you had been a revolutionary in June of 1848, there's a good chance that you would have had to carry out actions against Tocqueville, including shooting him. That was the reality of Tocqueville, what he did. He also enabled the dictatorship, the Bonapartist dictatorship to take place, the coup that took place in December 
1851. So I was struck by this and this behavior on the part of Tocqueville and began to look at his background and so on. And before 1848, sometime around about 1841, in a very instructive letter in which he is very self-reflexive, he says the following about himself. He says, my mind is attracted by democratic institutions, but I am instinctively aristocratic because I despise and fear mobs. At the most fundamental level, I passionately love freedom, legality, respect for rights, but not democracy. I hate demagoguery, the disordered actions of the masses, their violent and unenlightened intervention in public affairs. I belong neither to the revolutionary nor the conservative party, but when all is said and done, I incline towards the latter rather than the former because I differ from the conservatives over means rather than ends, while I differ from the revolutionaries over both means and ends. And again, this is 1841, and it really encapsulates and anticipates his behavior in the revolutions of 1848. He would do everything he could to prevent the disordered intervention of the masses in the public, in the policy, in the political process. At the same time that he was doing everything to crush the revolution, Marx and Engels were doing everything they could to advance the revolution where they operated in Germany. And it's fascinating to read both of their accounts because they're almost like mirror images of one another, but from opposite sides of the barricades. So the question for me, the interesting question was, all right, if you've got this person like Tocqueville, who's oftentimes assumed to be the shining light for democracy, his interest in democracy, how does his behavior, his political court, how does it affect what he presents, what he says about democracy, specifically a democracy in the United States? What if we took into account his actual practice, his political court itself? Would it help us to shed new light on democracy in America and his reading of the United States? The other part of the question is, and if Marx and Engels had far more deserved democratic credentials than Tocqueville in the 1848 events, how does that affect their reading? What did they have to say about the reality of politics in the United States? Now, one of the myths about Marx and Engels is that the United States did not figure significantly in their analysis. That's been repeated by a number of very informed people, but it's a myth. The United States figured significantly in their analysis. And this is what I take up in the first chapter of my book, and I try to make the case that the U.S. reality was instructive for Marx on his road to becoming a communist, the reality of the United States. I can't get into all the detail. We can take it up in a discussion and so on. But for Marx, as he's breaking with German philosophy, he's interested in what he calls the real movement of history, looking at reality, looking at what's actually going on in the political process. And as a radical democrat, he's trying to figure out, well, how do you bring about real democracy? And there's an example in the world. The most advanced political democracy in the world at that time was the United States. And what Marx concludes, based upon looking at the reality of the U.S., what was actually in place, is that if this is the best that liberal democracy, political democracy, had to offer, then something else was needed. If this was the best that political democracy had to offer, then something else was needed for human emancipation. In other words, the political liberation was insufficient. It was insufficient for human emancipation. And for Marx, 
the U.S. reality took him to looking at what he called civil society and the spinal column of civil society, which he called private property. Now, what did Marx draw upon in looking at the United States? Well, we know he read Tocqueville. His notes make very clear. He read Tocqueville, took Tocqueville very seriously, read Tocqueville's traveling companion, Gustave de Beaumont, who traveled with Tocqueville to the United States in 1831. He also read others, people like Thomas Hamilton from Manchester, who was also in the United States at the same time that Tocqueville. He also did two volumes, less well known about the United States. But Hamilton was much more critical of what he saw in the U.S. But it was materials such as these and writings such as these that led Marx to conclude, again, that if the United States was the best that liberal democracy had to offer, then something else was involved, something else was necessary in order to bring about real democracy, a human emancipation, as the young Marx called it. So this is how he began his political economy project, trying to figure out what's the essence of civil society. And this whole question of private property and how private property operates. And it was from this inquiry over the next two years, from about 1844, by this time he forms the partnership with Ingalls, until about 1846, that the historical materialist perspective, or the materialist conception of history, as they sometimes called it, came into existence and was formulated. And one of the major political conclusions of that, of course, was that the proletariat was the revolutionary class. It was the social, it was the class in society that had both the interest and capability of bringing about real emancipation, human emancipation. That was the central conclusion. And it was from that conclusion about the proletariat that Marx and Ingalls also recognized that any obstacle to bringing into the existence of the proletariat, bringing the proletariat into existence, any obstacle to that should be opposed. And the two big social formations that were obstacles to that process, the formation of a hereditary proletariat, of course, was feudalism. Here in Europe and in the United States, slavery. Slavery in the U.S. The existence of slavery was an obstacle to the emergence of a full-flown capitalist society. It was an impediment to the emergence of a hereditary proletariat. So those were the conclusions, early conclusions that Marx made. All right, I want to fast forward a little bit. I should say that Marx intervened on one important occasion in U.S. politics, specifically exile politics, in 1845 and 1846. German Americans, in the name of German communism, operating inside the United States, had taken a position that suggested that abolition, the ending of slavery, was unimportant to the working class. Marx intervened in that discussion. He and Ingalls intervened in that discussion in 1846 to denounce that view and to say that this was not representative of German communism. But it's after 1840, after the defeats of the 1848 revolutions, 1848-1849, and this is when Marx and the people close to Marx, who would constitute what is sometimes called the Marx party, that's the term that's used to refer to people who are close to Marx and Ingalls, who are part of the same political milieu as Marx and Ingalls, party people, the Marx party. It's after the defeat of the German revolutions by 1849-1850 that Marx and his closest associates begin to give close attention to the U.S. And the reason is that many of them go into exile to the U.S. Marx himself had considered moving to the U.S. The United States was a place where you could get published. It has the largest and the freest German press in the world at that time. This is where the 18th Brumaire is published for the first time. So Marx gave serious consideration 
uh, to move into the to the U.S., but decided that he had to stay in Europe uh, because of revolutionary developments there. But many of the people he worked very closely with, and the most important of those individuals was someone named Joseph uh, Weidemeyer. And Weidemeyer moved to the United States uh, in 1851. There was always a standing joke amongst the Marx people that the problem in moving to the U.S. is that you get lost in the United States, you get take, you get you, you get swallowed up. Uh, in the U.S., especially, you get enticed by access to becoming a landowner. And whatever kinds of revolutionary sentiments you may have once had, it's over with. All kinds of well-meaning people who went there as revolutionaries that were never heard from again. And that was always the, that was always the, <laughs> the concern. But what was the case of Weidemeyer? Weidemeyer uh, uh, hung in, and he worked very closely with Marx. These veterans, like Weidemeyer, these were veterans of the 1848-1849 revolutions. And what they saw themselves doing in the United States, they saw the United States as a place for another, another stage in the revolutionary process. What they sometimes call the Zweiter Freiheitskampf, the, uh, the second struggle for liberty. This is the way they saw the U.S. And very much on the agenda, of course, was the overthrow of slavery. They could relate to uh, the struggle uh, against slavery. It was not unlike the struggle against uh, against feudal, feudalism. So this is this is why this is they become active within the German within the German community, and they play a very important role because up until that time, German Americans who, uh, who people who had migrated to the United States tended not to think that the abolition question, slavery question, was important. It didn't affect them. It, it, it tended to abstain from it. That begins to change once these veterans from the 1848-1849 revolutions moved to uh, moved to the United States. They are they are small core but important core who helped to provide uh, a, an important play an important educational propaganda uh, effort within the German American community to win the German American community to the struggle against slavery. And you can see the contrast with the Irish. American communities, because you don't you don't have a similar uh, element like it. you don't have refugees from a revolution within the Irish American uh, community who can play a similar kind of role. Yes, before 1840, 1849, before this lay of people who come, these veterans, German American attitudes toward blacks, toward the slavery question were not that significantly different from uh, Irish American views. But that begins to change after this core comes into uh, migrates to the uh, uh, to the. Uh, uh, to the United States. It becomes clear to everyone that the, the, the slavery question, that's, that's the building question. That's, that's the important issue. The Republican Party is formed in 18, uh, 1854, the first explicit uh, party to, uh, in opposition to slavery, in support of abolition. They run a presidential candidate in 18, 1856, presidential uh, uh, election, who gets a significant amount of the vote and the German Americans, especially the veterans of the 1848-1849, they play a key role in the Republican in the Republican Party. This thing is building. Everyone recognizes it. this is going to hit the fan. This question of uh, slavery—it's got to be resolved. It's the central contradiction uh, within 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 the U.S. Uh, so the election, the nomination of Lincoln, is what brings this to a head. And Lincoln's nomination is very much the result of the activities of the uh, 48ers, as they are called, that is, the veterans of 1848. Illinois, the state of Illinois, this is where Lincoln comes out of, and the veterans of the 1848 revolution in Illinois are key. And the Marx Party people, like Weidemeyer and so on, they go to the nominating, they have to get the German American community on record in support of, of putting Lincoln up. They have no great. Lincoln is not the best person they would like, but they would. They, he's the best uh, 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 given the candidates and the person most much more likely to to win. So they they, they play an important role in Lincoln's nomination, and in, in Lincoln's once Lincoln is elected in November 1860, uh, this is interpreted by the slave owners that they have no future, and they decided to su uh, secede. From the uh, from the Union, and this is the beginning of the beginning of the Civil War, and immediately all of the veterans of 1848, all of the key Marx 
party people. They joined immediately the Union, the union armies. The organizations, the socialist communist organizations that they had already put in place, they, they had to disband them because everybody joined, the, uh, went into the military to fight on behalf of to fight on behalf of the uh, of the union, the union army. So they, they they welcomed this. They were they were they saw this they saw this development uh, from the, uh, they, they greeted this development with joy. And in the conclusion to that chapter, I say the following. To contrast their reaction to this, uh, to that of Tocqueville. Tocqueville died two years to the month before the outbreak of the war. His correspondence indicates that he followed developments in America closely, identifying himself at one point as partly an American citizen. He anticipated impending events with unmistakable dread. The very real likelihood of war depressed him. Tocqueville's aristocratic worldview prevented him from seeing what the enslaved and the abolitionists could. War as an opportunity for the overthrow of slavery. Nothing in his political core or perspective allowed him to see that such a decisive contest might actually advance the democratic process. Neither could he envision that immigrants from Germany would make a significant contribution in the outcome of that contest. Their, quote-unquote, rapid introduction into the United States, he wrote in 1854, quote, men foreign to the English race was the greatest peril that America would have to run and what makes the final success of the democratic institutions still an unresolved problem, unquote. The prospect that Tocqueville's absolute democracy, and this is how he described the United States in, his, uh, uh, in the final chapter, of his book, Democracy in America, in volume one. He describes it as an absolute democracy in which he says that the question of blacks and slaves are marginal to his question. It's marginal to his portrait of democracy in the United States. The prospect that Tocqueville's absolute democracy was going to war, a civil war at that, challenged in his eyes the claims he was famous for about the exemplary character of the U.S. polity. For Marx, on the other hand, war meant that the defiled republic, and this is how Marx described the United States as a defiled republic in his very famous letter to Abraham Lincoln congratulating him on his re-election in 1864. Whereas for Tocqueville, it was the absolute democracy. For Marx, it was the defiled, the defiled republic. Marx, the war meant that the defiled republic could finally cleanse itself of the stench of chattel slavery. Above all, this historic confrontation by rival social systems provided an opportunity for working people, including German communists, to participate in that momentous showdown to ensure that the democratic revolution, located this time on the soil of the adolescent United States, would not fail as it had in 1848-1849 in the old, old world of, of, of Europe. In the next chapter, what I do is to look at what Marx and Engels actually did once the war once the war breaks out. Uh, the priorities they give to this. Marx drops everything, including the writing of capital. This, he was on a he was making good progress on capital at this time. But he puts this on the, the back burner because he has to devote himself to to the uh, politics of the US the US US Civil War. Uh, his main practice is to defend the Union, to defend Lincoln against the, the, the bourgeois press here in, in Britain. The bourgeois press uh, supported the Confederacy, saw the Confederacy, the textile magnets and so on were dependent upon southern cotton. Uh, they, uh, uh, the South was, uh, was their ally. They uh, considered intervening on behalf of the Confederacy. And Marx's task was to carry out what he called a struggle in the press, a struggle against those who claimed that this was simply a war of secession. It was Marx's argument that this was more than a war of secession. Yes, Lincoln stated it this way initially. It simply was a war. And, but it was Marx's foresight to see that, no, this is not a war of secession. The fundamental issue here is the, over, is the question, uh, the question of, of slavery. And it was within that framework, it was within that framework, seeing that this is a revolutionary development, a revolutionary war, that Marx proved to have 
more foresight. He understood what Lincoln had to do before Lincoln was clear about what, what was necessary, necessary uh, to do. Uh, he also helped to, to build, to be a part of the anti-interventionist movement here in Britain. Uh, and for Marx, this was the, uh, this was the, uh, uh, the moment in which the working class in England uh, showed its best. Uh, it was in the working class areas, in the uh, places like Lancashire, uh, uh, in the textile uh, uh, manufacturing areas, where workers that were in the forefront of the, uh, the anti-interventionist movement to prevent British capital from leading the charge of British ruling class from intervening on, on behalf of the, uh, uh, of the uh, Confederacy. And Marx plays a very active role in that process. And his writings and song are very important. He has access to the most important newspaper in the United States. He's a correspondent, the, uh, the, Daily, the Daily Tribune, uh, who's one, one of whose uh, most ardent readers is Abraham, Abraham Lincoln. So Marx has to uh, bone up. He goes on a six-month cramming session to be able to understand U.S. history, to be able to see what the agenda was, what the actual, what, what, the, reali what the reality was. And, uh, and just to read from the conclusion of this, uh, this chapter and the significance of what Marx and Engels were, were able to, to, uh, to do. The outstanding feature of Marx and Engels' activities and those of their comrades in America before and during the Civil War is that they were integrally involved in the most important struggle against racism in history, the overthrow of slavery in the United States, the foundation upon which all modern struggles for progressive social change stand. The war was also the longest revolutionary upheaval that Marx and Engels ever lived through, and it necessarily enriched their understanding of that process. It's no accident that six years later, Marx titled his most important, pop his most popular work of his lifetime, the events of 1871, the workers' uprising of the Paris Commune. He entitled it the Civil War in France. The actions of the Marx Party during the U.S. Civil War were hardly inconsequential. Its programmatic insights, based upon the historical materialist framework, allowed its members to correctly view the uprooting of slavery as the precondition for the overthrow of capital. Capital itself understood this all too well. Tocqueville did not live long enough to see the Civil War. One can only speculate about what his reaction might have been. But there was nothing in his record to suggest that he would have enthusiastically embraced the cause of the Union or assisted it in the manner of Marx and Engels to score a victory over the slaveocracy, a triumph that did more to advance the global democratic struggle in the 19th century than in a single, in a single other event. In effect, then, Marx and Engels did more to make the title of Tocqueville's book, Democracy in America, a reality, did more to make that a reality than Tocqueville did, uh, did, him, did himself. Now, in the aftermath of the Civil War, with the victory over the slave owners, uh, it was Marx's hope and anticipation, Marx and Engels' uh, hope and anticipation, that with the overthrow of slavery, full-fledged capitalist development would bring into existence a hereditary uh, proletariat, and the class question, the class question would be put on the agenda. And this is what Marx is alluding to in his letter. He writes a congratulatory letter to Lincoln in 1864, again, congratulating him on his re-election. This is a letter written on behalf of the International Working Men's Association, the first international. Uh, in the letter, he says, while the working men the true political power of the North allowed slavery to defile their own republic, while before the Negro mastered and sold without his concurrence, they boasted it the highest prerogative of the white-skinned laborer to sell himself and choose his own master. They were unable to attain the true freedom of labor or to support their European brethren in their struggle for emancipation. But this barrier to progress has been swept off by the Red Sea of Civil War. What, what, what Marx is alluding to about this white-skinned labor and prerogatives is what in today's 
language we might refer to as white skin privilege. This is what Marx is talking about. And what he's saying here is that as long as slavery and the subordination of blacks was in place, it made it difficult for workers in white skin to see that they had common interests, common interests with workers in black skin. It undermined the potential for working class units. They had what some refer to as what some refer to the wages of whiteness. This was the reality that Marx was describing. So Marx is optimistic. Both he and Engels are very optimistic that once slavery is overthrown, the possibility therefore for class struggle is put on the agenda in the United States for the first time. And for a brief moment it looked that way. For a brief moment it looked that way indeed, that class struggle was very much on the agenda. You see this with the trade union. This is when the trade union movement comes into existence in the United States, immediately right after the Civil War, the victory over slave owners. Trade union movement gets off the ground and it takes an advanced position on a global basis and this is where the fight for the eight-hour workday begins. The fight for the eight-hour workday comes out of that, comes out of that struggle. An indication for Marx again about the, about the, why it was so important to overthrow, to overthrow slavery. 1876, 1877, the United States has for the first time a general strike in which blacks and whites come together in a way that had never, never been the case before. So it seems for a brief moment that the predictions that Marx, the optimism, the hopes of Marx and Engels indeed were being panned out. That ended by 1870, the beginning of 1877. It would take a couple of decades before it became clear the defeat. This period was known as radical reconstruction. A radical reconstruction was over with. Capital itself was very much aware of the potential for working class unity across racial lines. And it is in that context that capital begins to promote what would lead, what would become known as the Jim Crow system. The, the imposition of what Marx referred to as the branding process. The subordination of blacks. And there's a recent book that's been written about radical reconstruction, why it was overthrown, which, which substantiates in excruciating detail, substantiates indeed the, the claim of Marx and Engels that indeed it was capital that feared most this growing alliance between blacks, blacks and whites. So it comes to an end. So that prediction on the part, that hope on the part of Marx and Engels, it simply doesn't, doesn't pan out. But what does come into existence is indeed a hereditary proletariat. For the first time, a hereditary proletariat comes into existence in, in the United States. The United States becomes a full-fledged capitalist, capitalist society. Capital, capital takes over and in the process, a hereditary proletariat. What Marx did and Engels was left to Engels to relate to the struggle that was taking place in the United States. And activists, people who looked to the Marx party, who were inspired by their vision and so on, were oftentimes demoralized and depressed. They just didn't see, they didn't, they didn't see a workers' movement, a revolutionary workers' movement on the agenda. And there's, and it was Engels' task to sort of console them, to try to, the long durée, to, to think about the long-term developments within the United States. And in a very insightful letter in 1893, Engels talks, told one of the American comrades, said, look, there are three obstacles, at least three obstacles to the formation of, of a revolutionary workers' party. One, the legacy of, the legacy of, the United States lacks a feudal, a feudal past. The absence of a feudal past has undermined class consciousness, important aspect, legacy, and undermining class consciousness. A second development, and related in part, was the access to land, the ability to become a property owner, the move toward the West, the Western lands, was another important obstacle. And the third obstacle Engels talked about were the divisions within the working class. And there were two divisions of importance. One was the foreign-born 
against the native born, that division within, within the working class as an obstacle. And lastly, the Negro. And here he's referring to the race question, the legacy, the legacy of race, and how race uh, undermined the Jim Crow system, how it undermined, uh, undermined class, uh, class consciousness. But in that same level, uh, Ingalls foresees a time where indeed uh, class, class mobilizations, uh, the class struggle will be very much on the agenda. And his hope is exactly because with hereditary proletariat and the laws of capital, the logic of capital itself, and all that brings in its wake will be the basis for the formation of a revolutionary movement in the U.S. In the conclusions, uh, I speculate, uh, it's much more speculative, and here what I'm trying to do in the conclusions is to address the question, well, what happened after the second Reconstruction? We refer to sometimes the Civil Rights Movement as the second Reconstruction. If the first Reconstruction failed, we were not able to overcome the historical divisions, racial divisions within the working class. What about the second Reconstruction, the Civil Rights Movement after the 1960s? So this is what I'm speculating on. This is uh, in, the, in, in, in the conclusions. And I argue that the hereditary proletariat that came into existence that Marx and Engels foresaw was crucial in the victory of the civil rights movement. It was a proletarian black uh, a community that was in the forefront, was in the forefront of the, uh, of the civil rights movement. And this movement had enormous consequences politically in ways that we oftentimes don't think. It was a movement that broke the back, it was a civil rights movement that broke the back of McCarthyism. Uh, in the United States. It was a civil rights movement that also opened up the, what we call sometimes the second wave of feminism. And there's an interesting parallel here because in the 19th century, it was a struggle against abolition, the struggle against slavery, the abolitionist movement, that opened up the, the first wave uh, of feminism. And it's coming out of the civil rights movement uh, that we see a resurgence of the, uh, of the, women's, of the women's movement. And other movements for progressive, progressive uh, change. Uh, the conclusions I reach are that there are new opportunities. There are new opportunities in the United States unlike ever before. At no time in the history of the United States has the working class been as integrated racially as it is today. No time in its history has the working class been as integrated. And, and, and connected, related to that very much is the, uh, both gender and national questions. Uh, the diversity of the working class, and all of this is the product, the product of the of the civil rights movement. For example, immigration laws. It's no accident that immigration laws in the United States are liberalized in 1965. It's the one of the products, another product of the uh, of the civil rights movement. So I argue that uh, these developments that have taken place in the United States with the Second Reconstruction, I think, have placed the class struggle on the agenda in the United States in a way that's never been the case before uh, in, uh, in U.S. history. I immediately say that this is simply, we're talking about potential. We're not talking about inevitabilities. We're not talking about inevitabilities. All we're saying is that the potential for class struggle, when you combine that also to with the crisis of late capitalism, beginning in the mid-1970s, the profitability crisis, all that it seems to me opens up opportunities, and those opportunities I have are opportunities that have to be that have to be taken advantage of. And what I, as I end in uh, uh, in the conclusions, if capitalist crises and the political polarization they breed, including their drive toward war, are inevitable. The successful forging of a socialist alternative is not. This is why, contrary to all the many misreadings of Marx, party building was always at the center of his project. This book, therefore, constitutes a conscious intervention in the assistance of that uh, effort. And it's my hope that those who are inspired by the actual record of Marx and, uh, and Engels uh, will indeed uh, be a part of the process to forge uh, a working class, uh, for the first time, a real working class alternative.
Yeah, on the uh, AFL and the racist character of the American Federation of, uh, of Labor, uh, I alluded slightly to this and I talked about uh, Engels' comment in 1893 about the uh, obstacles to a revolutionary uh, workers, workers' party. Uh, the AFL uh, reflected very much this, uh, all of the weaknesses uh, that Engels is, uh, is, is alluding to. And uh, it, won't, it wouldn't be really until the 1930s with the birth of the uh, CIO, uh, Congress of Industrial Organizations, uh, with, the, with this change uh, within the labor movement. Uh, a part of it was a reflection of the of growing labor aristocracy uh, within the uh, within the AFL, but it, uh, I think the race issue, the race issue, the overthrow of Jim, uh, I'm sorry, the overthrow of radical Reconstruction, really sets the tone in the context. It affects it affects everything. Uh, this, by the way, I'm related to uh, one of my arguments about what happens after 19, uh, 1965. As radical as developments were in the 1930s in the United States. Uh, I think uh, Jim Crow was an obstacle. It, it placed limits on how far that radicalization in the 1930s could go. And this is why I think 19, post-1965 is so different uh, from, from those earlier developments. Uh, yes, on Bush and uh, democracy, I, I, I agree with you. Let me just say, though, that uh, for Marx, uh, Marx never deprecated what existed in the United States. His view of it was, was that it was incomplete, that it was uh, p uh, political democracy uh, was not to be equated with human emancipation. But the working class could certainly make use of it. The working class needed political democracy in order to advance its own its own interests, its own class, its own its own class interests. So there were people sometimes who would dismiss the United States, and Marx was critical, like LaSalle, Ferdinand LaSalle when he would make disparaging comments about uh, U.S. democracy and uh, Marx was critical of them and said, no, no. Uh, it's, from Tocqueville, again, it was this finished product. Marx, it was a work in, pro in progress. Uh, on the Marx uh, party, that's, a, that's an important question and uh, uh, the letters of Engels to the uh, Americans uh, a very useful in getting a sense of this problem. The death, no doubt, of uh, Weidemeyer in 1866 left a big, big deficit. There was no one that really to, to fill the shoes of Weidemeyer. And those people who were still left for the Marx Party were still very much under the influence of Lasallian concepts. And they brought with them uh, a degree of dogmatism and sectarianism. And you see this in Engels' letter. He's always critical of them. He said, why don't you all try to learn English, you know, and be a part of the class struggle? Yes, it's not theoretically perfect, you know, but be a part of it. Yeah, he's constantly on that case. Uh, it's the, uh, it's the social, Socialist Labor Party. Uh, and uh, he's, he's critical of them for not being not embracing being a part of the movement, but always wanting to preach to the Americans. And so, yes, this is a so they become yes they become uh, increasingly obsolete, and and it opens up space for other other currents such as the uh, uh, such as the anarchists. And it won't be until the Russian Revolution. It won't be in the best of that layer who went into the wobblers and so on, who came out of the wobblers and uh, helped to. Uh, uh, Helped to bring to existence uh, uh, the communist the communist party. It's the, the, the Russian Revolution. I, it doesn't fully answer your question. It's much more complex. But uh, Engels's letters are very very helpful in giving you a feel of the difficulties. Uh, yeah, just uh, uh, thanks very much for those very uh, kind remarks about the book. Uh, yeah, uh, doing doing the research on this, and I hope it comes through. I, I think one is insp inspired by the example of Marx and Engels. If you've got any, any kind of revolutionary uh, 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 sensibilities, I think as you're going through this and walking through uh, the pages as they're trying to figure out what to do, 
uh, and how do you uh, how do you come to grips with various kinds of issues? It's extremely extremely uh, uh, inspiring. And uh, so yes, I, I agree thoroughly that the importance of individuals uh, uh, taking action. Uh, uh, action that's informed by their theoretical perspective. This is why, indeed, Marx had the foresight. It's true he and uh, Engels had a debate. It's the only sustained debate I've ever come across between uh, Marx and Engels. It was around the question of the war. And, uh, yeah, Engels was a little bit more pessimistic. They had formed the division of labor uh, in their writing, and Marx would do the political economy stuff, and Engels would focus on the military side of it. And uh, Marx... Uh, told Engels once, uh, chiding him about his, uh, his, uh, his pessimism, says, I think you take, you're focusing too much on the military side of things. And, uh, and, I, think he, and I think he was correct, and that uh, Marx indeed had a, had a better sense of, uh, of uh, indeed what was on the agenda. He, and, and the significance of this in Lincoln, his comments about Lincoln, I think he paid one of the highest compliments ever to the United States, what had been achieved on the United States, in the United States. Someone like a Lincoln could do what he did. Uh, whereas in the old world, that wasn't possible for someone like like Lincoln. Uh, uh, his comments about the U.S. Constitution, Lincoln tearing up the U.S. Constitution. At first, I thought this was I thought Marx was overstating the case, but he he was referring to the Emancipation Proclamation and the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation, and indeed was because there was an interesting case the other day in the U.S. Supreme Court about uh, eminent domain and whether that can the government take uh, take property. But boy, this was the most radical seizure of property in modern history. Uh, every time where slaves, everywhere else in the world, uh, slave owners would get compensated. That's what Tocqueville was. That was, that was Tocqueville's solution to the slavery question in the, in the Caribbean. He always compensated the slave owners. But uh, Lincoln confiscates the slaves' property without compensation. That had never happened anywhere anywhere in the world. And this was indeed a very, very radical, radical development, and we really should never, never forget about it. And yes, I think the Civil War, really, it is really the breakthrough movement in the 19th century. And uh, the working class here in uh, England was very much aware of that, very much aware of the significance of the, uh, of the Civil War. Um, someone asked about the bourgeois, the la yeah, uh, and I, I, the formulation I use is that the Second Reconstruction completes the, the bourgeois democratic revolution in the United States. The Second Reconstruction, that is, the Civil Rights Movement, completes uh, the bourgeois democratic revolution when uh, African Americans become citizens, full citizens of the United States for the first time. And it puts the class agenda on the, uh, 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 the, the class question on the agenda. My experience in the classroom with young people, it's easier to talk about class in the black community in a way that wasn't before the Civil Rights Movement. It's exactly because you got the Candelisa uh, Rices and the Colin Powell's and so on. As long as the Jim Crow system was in place, it was much more difficult to make the case for class. But now with people like that, yes, this, this, you know, it's easy now. <laughs> it's easy to make the case, uh, the case for, uh, for class. And the same thing, of course, with the women's movement. And, uh, also. Just a... Uh, uh, a number of sort of diverse uh, comments. Someone had asked earlier about uh, American American Indians. It's in that final chapter in uh, Tocqueville that I alluded to that uh, Tocqueville also takes up the topic of American Indians and sees them also as peripheral, marginal to his story of uh, uh, democracy. Marx himself didn't uh, address it explicitly. However, at the end of his life, we know from his notebooks, he was doing a tremendous amount of reading, taking lots and lots of notes on uh, American Indians and indigenous peoples, uh, not only in the U.S. and North America, but uh, in other parts of the other parts of the world. He was really uh, uh, struck with and trying to make sense and understand the uh, uh, the reality of uh, indigenous uh, indigenous uh, peoples. On the significance of the Civil War, another aspect of the Civil War is to looking at it from the perspective of Latin America and the impact. It's no accident that the uh, Cuban War for Independence finally gets off the ground. <laughs> In 1868, up until then, uh, the slave owners in Cuba had always hoped that they would be they would be annexed uh, uh, by the United States. But once uh, once uh, the uh, slavery is overthrown in the United States, it's just finally it's it's this is when the War of Independence, Independence Movement, finally gets off the ground in Cuba and in Brazil. The same thing also. To slave owners in Brazil, boy, they waited up, every day they waited at the dockside to get the newspapers 
from Unisys. <laughs> they understood that their future <laughs> depended on what was happening, what was happening uh, in, the, uh, in the U.S. On the question of Mexico, yeah, I take up action of Mexico in the book uh, because uh, it represents, along with two other cases, I argue, Algeria and India. And it shows the, um, uh, the modifications that Marx and Engels made in their historical materialist perspective. In all three cases, certainly in the case of Algeria and in Mexico, there's a sense uh, in, their early, in their first comments in 1847, 1848, that this is, imperialism is a, is, a progressive, is a progressive advance. Uh, the takeover of northern Mexico, uh, the takeover of Algeria, what the French are doing in Algeria and so on. And that comes through a little bit in some of Marx's comments on India in the early comments in 1850, 1852. Uh, I argue that the, uh, the tone of that changes. As they learn more about Mexico, it becomes very clear. This is a part of Marx's cr cramming, trying to get up to speed on the U.S. reality, begins to realize that northern Mexico has taken over in order to advance slavery. That's, the, that's, that's what the slave owners have to, have to do. So, yeah, he's, he's critical of that development, what, what, what happened. And uh, he becomes a partisan of uh, Benito, uh, Benito Juarez. Uh, so it's not much, but it's... Uh, but it's uh, but it's there, and I think a similar argument can be made in the case of a, uh, a decade later, uh, uh, Engels' comments about Algeria. Uh, complete, he's a complete partisan of the uprising uh, uh, of the struggle against the French uh, in Algeria by 1857. They, uh, 18, 1857, yeah, 1847 comments know this was an advance for, um, an advance for civilization and for the, not civilization, but in, uh, the overthrow of feudal feudal society, an institution of, uh, of capitalist uh, imperialism was an advance. That changes. Uh. Well, <laughs> but I, really, but I, I, I really appreciate uh, uh, people's comments. I mean, it's uh, very uh, pleasing to, uh, to hear them. And, uh, and again, uh, I write both of these books and books, I see them as tools, uh, for revolutionaries to make use of and uh, to be inspired by the example, by the examples of uh, Marx and Engels, they left us with a great, a great legacy. It's our duty. We have an obligation to make to make use of uh, their experiences and so on. And I always encourage people to to plow into uh, 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 all 50 volumes. They find the the the, uh, the, the last. Number, uh, volume 50 came out last year, and I'm in the process of reading uh, Engels' final letter, letters, and they're just really inspiring. Uh, his revolutionary optimism at the end of his life is uh, really, really encouraging. And so, uh, so with that, uh, again, thank you for uh, uh, inviting me to be here, and I really appreciate what you had to say.